All right. I'm really excited to present to you today the big picture. Let's dive right in. So the reason I've made this lecture is because I think people tend to focus on the wrong things when looking at solvers. And really the question of today's lecture is how do you get the most out of GTO Wizard? or any solver for that matter. A lot of people, they're gonna spend time looking at minutia, studying noise, focusing on the small things rather than trying to absorb the bigger picture. And I think the best way to use a solver is to be looking for broader heuristics, focusing on the overarching strategy rather than zoning in on inconsequential noise. So today's lecture is gonna be teaching you various strategies and tools that you can use in your own game to try and find the bigger picture and stop focusing on noise. And this process of finding the bigger picture is what I call seeing the forest through the trees. Now, instead of focusing on, you know, why does this suit do this, but that suit does that. Instead, you should be looking at the broader strategy pair. You can use certain methods such as focusing on thresholds, looking at the entire range strategy instead of hand strategies, analyzing villain's response, considering exploits, trying to find the overarching picture. So before I begin, I'd like to explain to you guys why you shouldn't be focusing so much on trying to memorize a specific strategy, rather you should be focusing on the larger strategy. So I'm gonna show you this interesting experiment I've run. This is an under the gun versus big blind spots, cash game, Jack 10, five. Let's take a look at this solution. So under the gun is opened, big blind calls, flop is Jack 10, five, two tone, and here's the strategy. Now we can see it typically is going to mix somewhere between 75, 33, and 50, checking back about 40% of the time. This is one strategy. This strategy is solved to less than 0.3% Nash distance. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that if you play against this strategy, the best possible counter strategy, the ultimate god strategy against this solution will gain at most 0.3% of the pot. What does that come out to? Well, the pot is 5.5, 0.3% of that is 0.165 big blinds. That is the entire strategy, can beat it for that much. So let's go take a look at the experiment now. I took this specific spot and plugged these ranges and the bedding tree and the rake and everything else into different solvers to see the results. Here's one I did on GTO Plus, and it comes up with a different strategy. This one's using a smaller bet more often, checking a little less often. I also tried it with Pio, and Pio seems to never use the 75% pot-sized bet. And at the end, we get three completely different strategies that all have the same accuracy, the same expected value, same rake, but completely different strategies. For example, we could see that GTO Wizard, which uses G Silver or Jess Silver, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, is mixing 33, 50, and 75% pot sized bets. We can see that Pio Silver is only using 33 and 50%, never using 75. And we can see that GTO Plus, well, they're leaning more heavily towards the smaller bet and not so much using the half pot bet. So, three very different strategies, all resulting in the same exploitability. So I want you guys to just type in the chat, why do you think this is? Why is it that three completely different strategies can result in the same expected value? Solving algorithm? Yeah, they're using different algorithms to approximate equilibrium. This is true. Multiple local maximums. Absolutely, well said, Elgato. There is not just one GTO solution, there are often multiple. Mixed strategies? Yes, it's possible to achieve the same Nash distance with different types of mixed strategies. And so realistically, different solver algorithms can yield different results. Madman asks, so if you node locked two of those different solvers to fight each other, each would still capture the same EV? Yes, but you'd have to node lock the entire strategy, not just the flop, but turn and river as well, fighting each other. And so different solvers can yield different solutions. All three of these solutions converge to the same exploitability, and there is not just one solution, there are multiple. And so it doesn't make sense to obsess over trying to memorize one specific strategy or to obsess over this exact frequency or that exact frequency. Because as we saw earlier, maybe you have ace queen here that's using this strategy, but if you're looking at a different solver algorithm, perhaps ace queen starts using an overbet 
or mixing all three. And so the actual frequency, which with you mix a specific hand is inconsequential. What actually matters is the way you construct your entire range, you see? And so this is why it's important to look at the broader picture, look at the overarching strategy rather than zoning in on inconsequential frequencies. What Ace Queen here, what Ace Queen does here in a vacuum does not matter without the context of its broader strategy. So what strategies can we as humans look for to find the larger picture? How do we find the forest through the trees? How to study Sims? I'm going to go over a number of concepts in this lecture. We're going to talk about memorization versus intuition. We're going to talk about finding thresholds, hand class patterns, aggregate trends, polarity and equity analysis, blockers, looking at villain strategy, and how to consider counter exploitability. So this first one is going to be contentious. There's a lot of debate in the silver community over the simplicity or complexity of the sims you look at. And the truth is that there are trade-offs between a complex sim and a simple sim. You see, a complex sim, one that has many sizes throughout the tree, will better represent the true game tree. It is going to be more flexible, whereas a simplified sim is obviously easier to implement and more human playable per se, but it's not going to truly represent the game space. So you're going to get noise. So let's first look at the pros of simplicity versus complexity. Now a simplified sim is easier to implement. There are, you're going to make fewer mistakes because there's less mixing. It's just an easier strategy and fewer mistakes is already going to add a lot to your win rate. Simplified strategies are obviously better for multi-tabling and autopilot. It's better for spots where you're not trying to adapt your strategy so much, you're just trying to play a default strategy. And the main argument for a simplified memorization strategy is that pretty much every strategy is very close anyway, as long as it's relatively balanced. The EV gain between an extremely complex strategy and a very simple strategy is quite small. There are marginal, decreasing marginal returns to adding complexity to your strategy. And as the saying goes, a simple strategy implemented well will invariably outperform a complex strategy implemented poorly. I'm sure you've heard many coaches talk about this. I'm, I'm, I know Salo has covered this topic along with pretty much every other coach. Now I'd like to talk about the pros of a more complex sim. Now a complex sim gives you flexibility. It creates adaptable strategies. For example, if you just node lock your sim or if you just only give it a one third bet size on the flop, how do you know how to respond against different sizes? Studying complex sims is better for building your intuition. It gives you the ability to improve how you think for yourself, to find the underlying reasons, which can ultimately build a better theoretical understanding. And finally, a more complex sim has less artificial distortion. Now, what do I mean by this? A sim that does not correctly map the actual game space or at least approximate it, is going to have artificial distortion because the solver will try and exploit the limitations of your game tree. If you don't give it the right sizes, perhaps it can bet a little thinner. If you can't donk, well then perhaps in position checks back more. And there's all sorts of examples like this where oversimplified simulations lead to artificial distortion that look easier to implement but are solving for a toy game version of poker that is less applicable to the real game. And so there are always trade-offs. So we can look at the cons. So a simplified strategy has its own cons. Simple sims, of course, have a lot of artificial distortion from the solver exploiting them at the limitations of the game tree. They tend to be very rigid and you won't really learn how to adapt to different lines because you haven't given it very many lines. You can't really learn too much about the underlying principles because you can't see, for example, what bet sizes are preferred, how to react, what your price elasticity is against different sizes. This ultimately leads to worse exploitative capabilities because you're just trying to memorize a strategy rather than understand it. And furthermore, memorization is just not effective for some learning types. Some people simply cannot memorize well. They need to learn through intuition. Now, complex sims, of course, are simply impossible to memorize. Even a two sizing strategy, you will never implement correctly. That's not the point. You're, you shouldn't try to memorize a complex strategy. Rather, your goal is to intuit the overarching strategy behind it. Now, this approach, of course, will lead to many more blunders at first, and that's going to cut into your win rate. It takes longer to see the benefits 
and you're going to spend more time looking at noise if you don't know what to look for. And furthermore, this intuitive study method where you're looking at complex sims and trying to find the underlying strategy, the big picture, is simply not an effective strategy for some learning types. Some people simply must memorize, they're not good at abstraction. And so realistically, you need to find a hybrid approach between memorization and intuition. Now, let's talk about the limits of memorization. How many strategies would you need to memorize just to know your big blind defense and single raise pots? Well, okay, the, the tightest formation of a big blind defense in a single raise pot is about 230 combinations, sometimes double that. On each flop, there are 49 times 48, 2,352 2, runouts per flop, 1755 strategically distinct flops, and at least five positions to memorize UTG through small blind versus big blind. And if you multiply this out, we get a lower bound for the number of things to memorize, which is about 4 billion. And this does not include memorizing your opponent's strategy, how to respond to different betting lines. This is assuming there's like, you know, only one betting line doesn't include three bet, four bet pots, cold calls, different opening sizes, rake structures, or anything outside in position versus big blind single raise pot. As you can see, trying to use a pure memorization approach is completely impossible. There are way, way too many things to try and memorize. So you cannot become an expert poker player through memory alone. You need to use a hybrid approach between building intuition and memorization. How do we do that? Well, you memorize spots that appear more often. So for example, pre-flop strategies can often be memorized, especially in games with stable stack sizes, such as cash games. It's much easier to memorize pre-flop. Uh, spinning goes also involve a ton of memory. Even though there's variable stacks, it's going to involve a lot of pure memory. Now, you can also memorize, for example, flop C betting heuristics, not the exact flop strategy, but you can memorize, for example, value thresholds, what is appropriate to bet for value on one or two streets, and you can memorize common betting lines. You know, if you're playing 100 big blinds deep, 33%, and then over bet turn, and then bet river. Now, on the other hand, you do need to develop that intuition. So use intuition for further away streets. Like, you're not going to be able to memorize rivers, there's way too many rivers. You need to be able to use your brain solver for this. Intuition serves your exploitative capabilities better. Intuition is better for understanding the underlying reason behind theory, intuiting patterns, intuiting value and continuation thresholds in lines you haven't seen before, and of course, trying to imagine your opponent's response. And so realistically, anyone that says it needs to be one or the other, oversimplified or over complex, hasn't considered the trade-offs. You do need both. You need a combination of memorization and intuition to truly grow as a poker player. So before I continue, do you guys have any questions about the trade-offs of simplicity versus complexity? Feel free to type in the chat. Okay, no questions there. You guys are great so far. Let's talk about thresholds. Oh, hold on, we got a question. Why don't we start at the river and work our way back? Because a lot of our opponents study flop, asks Johan. Johan, very interesting question. Why don't we start at the river? I would say the biggest thing to prevent you from starting at the river are that there are 2,352 rivers per flop. Now, that said, I've heard a lot of very strong players say that the thing that sets them apart from weaker players is that they focused on follow through. They focused on how to continue on turn and river rather than just trying to memorize, you know, the, the best flop sizing, whatever that means. So there is a there is some truth to this that playing later streets better, playing them more effectively can actually be a huge boost to your win rate. But starting at the river and working backwards is difficult because there are simply so many rivers to work backwards from. That said, you can do things such as learning value thresholds to learn what is appropriate to river bet, what value classes can go for two or three streets on what runout, uh, what hands are appropriate to defend versus different lines. And this is the study of thresholds. Thresholds are lines of indifference within your range. So. Mixed hands are indifferent. If you see a hand that's mixing between fold and call, that is a mixed continue, meaning this hand is zero EV, it's the same value as folding. If you see a hand that's mixing between a call and a raise, and the raise, if called, is still ahead of the calling range, that's a mixed value continuation. And so one of the shortest and easiest ways 
to improve your poker is simply studying thresholds. This is something you should be looking for anytime you look at a sim. You're, you should be asking yourself which value hands are appropriate to bet or raise here which hands are appropriate to continue with versus this size on this board. You should always be looking for these value and continuation thresholds. Now, furthermore, why is this important? Well, continuation thresholds, that is to say, which hands are appropriate to continue with versus some size, these tell you what the bottom of your range is. So instead of trying to memorize everything separately, if you have an idea where the bottom of your range is, you can sculpt your entire strategy upwards from there. And similarly, value thresholds tell you what hands you are representing for value. You're of course going to balance that with some bluffs, some semi bluffs, some draws, but you should know what you're representing because that's going to guide your bet sizing strategies on later streets. Does this run out, help my value and so on. So these thresholds sculpt your overall strategies and make it easier to understand how you should be playing, not just now, but on later streets. Now, thresholds are blurry at first. So this picture here is from a flop. We can see that it's mixing calls with a lot of different hand classes, and that's because some of these second and third pair are draws. They are blurry at first, especially pre-flop and on the flop, but these thresholds tend to crystallize towards the river as there's less draw equity. I'm gonna show you guys how we can go about studying these thresholds and using these to improve our own play. Mainly, we're gonna be looking at the filters and breakdown tabs. So let's take a look at an example. So here we have a 500 NL cash game, button versus big blind, queen, nine, four. Now we can see that it's mixing all sizes here, right? And when people look at this, they're going to feel a little overwhelmed. Uh, sorry, I have this on horizontal mode, which shows every combination separately. This is my preferred way to study Sims. I'm gonna change it to vertical for this board because I think people are more familiar with this view. So first thing you should be doing is looking at the filters tab. I use the filters tab constantly when I study. I don't think there's a better tab to be using. Now, let's say we bet some size here, 75%. We'll take a look at big blind here. When I look at big blind's response, I'm not looking at what individual hands are doing. My eyes are going straight to the filters tab. This is the first thing I look at. So let's find the continuation threshold for made hands. It's gonna be right about here, third pair. How do I know that? Because there's a little bit of blue there, right? That tells me that this is where it's mixing, okay? And so this is the cutoff point. Now, here's a question that I'm sure the advanced players will know, but just to test you guys, why is it that facing a 75% pot size bet, we're always continuing with a four, but we start folding five, sixes, sevens, and eights? Does anyone wanna take a guess? Blocking bottom set, robust equity, more outs, better blocker. Yes, 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 yes. Five outs versus two. Ah, this is this is the main thing. More outs. Because you want to be able to outdraw villain's value. And of course, blocking sets is important. But what's probably much stronger is the fact that you can outdraw their value more easily. You see, Button's betting range doesn't actually contain all that all that many sets, right? In fact, we can see this in the Actually, we can just do this. We can hover over this icon and we can see that sets only account for 2.6% of their betting range in this line. So blocking sets will certainly is part of it. Also blocking two pair and such. Being able to outdraw the top of their range with outs to two pair and trips has value because you'll more easily be able to get paid off. Now, conversely, these hands here, they only have two outs. So always consider how you can outdraw value. Anyway, back to thresholds here. Third pair is the line of indifference, particularly these pocket pairs with poor equity realization. These under pairs always folding. You can also look at these draw thresholds. For example, you're never folding an open ender and you're just starting to fold some gut shots here particularly gut shots without a backdoor flush draw. Sahaj asks, why top two and bottom two pairs raise on flop, but not top and middle? Okay, that's a question. Take a look at the two pairs here, and we can change that to equity. We see it's very close between the two. 
And this might just have something to do with the equity threshold. Now, realistically, you can probably design a strategy where you, for example, check all of these and raise all of these and achieve pretty much the same exploitability. However, if you start moving the thresholds around such that, for example, top and middle or top and bottom is always raising, but top two is always calling, well, perhaps your thresholds will be off and your strategy becomes more exploitable. Perhaps you start overplaying some hands, for example. Anyway, the important thing to realize here isn't per se the exact hands that you're raising, rather it's the overarching strategy. So something you can look at, for example, is bluff value ratios. How many sets to two pair? How many value hands am I raising? And this is something I'm going to go into a bit more detail later. Just to finish up on thresholds, Whenever you're going through this, take a look at the filters tab and always look at which hands are mixing. You can also do this in the breakdown tab. Now here we can see blue and green and we can see immediately that third pair starts to fold right around here, right? We can see exactly where the mixed continues are and we can also see the value threshold. So it's about two pair is right about where it starts mixing. And the weakest two pair we have is queen four, no backdoor flush draw. How would the thresholds compare on different solvers you tested? Would they be about the same? They can be, but you always have to put it in context of the overarching strategy. If the solver starts preferring a larger size, that can move the thresholds around. And realistically, as long as you're using appropriate value for the size you've decided to use on some flop, then it's going to make sense. For example, you can't just start raising a bunch of top pair no kicker against a large size, but you might be able to do it against a smaller size. So it always comes down to pricing. Now I could go into a lot more about how I analyze this hand, but there's other stuff I wanna cover here. So let's go back to the presentation and we'll get back to that flop in just a moment. So something else we can try here is comparing hand classes on different boards. Now, focusing on one hand class and changing the boards to extracting betting patterns is a fun way to try and build heuristics. Once we find these heuristics, we try to break them. And once we break them, we try to understand why our heuristic stops working on a certain board. So let's take a look at some examples here. So here we have king, queen, two. And again, it's mixing, mostly preferring an overbet. Now, a strategy to see what you should be doing rather than trying to memorize everything in particular is to try and understand how different hand classes play. So for example, if we just look at this value portion of our range, the over pairs plus, we can see that they're rarely checking, almost exclusively over betting, mixing in some other large sizes as well. And we can see that, for example, when we block top pair, Queens, for example, it's gonna to start to size down a bit. Now, conversely, we can say, just look at the third pair. These are gonna be the under pairs below the queen and above the two. And we can notice the betting pattern here, typically the more vulnerable pocket pairs are betting more often. And that's because when you put these into a large bet line, they're not gonna have much equity against the calling range. And so the most efficient way to do it would be to take the ones with the least amount of value, the ones that block the least folds, and to put those into your overbet line. Now, what happens if we change the board? For example, let's make this an ace. We see the same pattern emerge here, okay? Well, what happens if we keep changing this? For example, let's say it's gonna be, I don't know, jack 10-2. We see the same pattern emerge, the more vulnerable ones betting more often. Um, I'm just focusing on these under pairs here. And this is ignoring the broader strategy, but it is just a method to try and find general heuristics. I'm studying one hand class at a time. And now we're going to try to break it. So here we'll look at Jack Jack 4, filter for these under pairs here. And here we see that it is, well, I mean, obviously tens are betting less often than fives, just a sminch. But realistically, this board is betting so wide that you can put more marginal value into this betting range. The other boards we looked at were over bets. And for that reason, these acted more as semi bluffs. And so here we're more pushing our equity. It's a different strategy. 
So like I said, you can do this with different hand classes, second pair, third pair, try and find common patterns by changing the board type, and then try and break your heuristic and figure out why by putting it in the context of the larger strategy. Another way to utilize, to find the strategies here is to utilize filtering. I think a lot of people, they don't, they either don't know or they don't use a lot of the different analysis tools that are built into GTO Wizard. And one of my favorite parts of GTO Wizard is the advanced filtering. So for example, we can use equity buckets to separate value from bluffs. We can group similar bet sizes together and see how that range is constructed. We can exclude and include suits as needed. So let me show you another example here. So here we have button versus big blind on jack 10 six. Again, we're looking at a cash game. We bet 75 on the flop. They've called actions on us on the turn. Now, first thing to look at, where are the thresholds? What hands are appropriate to bet for value? Well, we see there are eight different actions going on here. That's a little complicated, but if we look closer, realistically, this is an overbet or check spot, right? Realistically, this is overbet check. And so when we look at it this way, it becomes a little simpler. If we look at the overbet strategy, we can see that top pair, specifically top pair with a kicker above the jack, is going to be the bottom of our value bet range. And we can confirm this by selecting the overbet and using these equity bucket filters. This is isolating our value range, right? So on the turn, we want to isolate our value range we would do this, maybe this as well, maybe the best hands and the good hands. And here we've isolated the very top of our range that is betting for value. And conversely, we can select these bottom two and say these are the hands that are betting as bluffs, right? And now we can see, for example, that most of our bluffs are going to involve these overcard gut shots, draws, I'll change that to horizontal, lots of diamonds, and let's go ahead and just exclude the flush draws because those are very obvious. And here we can say that over bets that don't have diamonds either need uh, to have a direct draw like 8-7 or they need over cards to the board. In other words, you need to be able to outdraw your opponent's value range. And so instead of trying to memorize the exact hands, I'm memorizing these patterns, right? I'm saying, what do the overbet patterns look like? You really want some uh, overcards that outdraw their value, and that's how I analyze this, is by just looking at various filters. Right, so again, use equity buckets. Something else you can do is use the ranges tab as a filter. You can go to advanced buckets, and here we can study the distribution. We can also say, for example, just isolate the very strongest hands, this is 80% plus, whereas these equity buckets here are coarser. This is only 75%, 50 or 33. Um, now, I was going to present this in my PowerPoint later on, but I might as well show you here. You can press this button to toggle full screen mode. And I really like looking at the equity bucket distributions to get a glimpse of the polarity of the strategy. Do you guys notice this curve right here? This little curve in the equity bucket analysis. Well, notice that button has most of these 80% plus equity hands that represents 18% of their range. It only represents 4.8% of big blinds range. Button also has more trash. They have more hands down here at the bottom, right? That's like 65% of their range. And they have fewer middling hands in between. It's only 16. So buttons range is, can anyone tell me what this word is? This shape? Mm-hmm. That's right. They are polarized. And when they're polarized, a button range is trash. No, sir. They are polarized. Polarized. So when, when they're polarized, you're going to see more big bet strategies. That is to say they have an advantage near the top and they have more trash whereas this blue line has more middling hands. Now, when they're polarized, you already know that the strategy is going to be close to geometric. That is to say, you're going to bet in such a way as to try and get stacks in by the river. Why do we do that? Well, this is, okay, I'm getting a little outside my lecture today, but the reason that you bet geometrically when you're polarized 
is because that is the way to maximize the amount of money that goes into the pot. And so betting an equal fraction on each street to, such that you get stacks and by the river is the optimal strategy when you're perfectly polarized. Furthermore, this is compounded by the fact that the polarized player is more or less clairvoyant. When they overbet the turn, the button will pretty much know if they're ahead or behind, whereas the vast majority of big blinds range is guessing. They are not clairvoyant. Anyway, that's, that's going more into theory land. I want to keep this more focused on the practical implications of studying GTO. So we've talked about this a bit. We've already seen that you can use the ranges tab to observe polarity. You can also, of course, use it to compare different hand classes. Now, I see this all the time in the Discord. People are constantly asking questions. Why does this hand do this? Why do we want to take this strategy? And pretty much universally, if you're asking anything to do with blockers, or why does this hand prefer this? Well, that hand prefers that. You need to be looking at both ranges. Particularly, you need to be analyzing villain's response. And so utilize the ranges tab, go through not just equity buckets, but hand classes, try and see where the advantages lie, try and see who has proportionally more of what hand class. In fact, let me go back here in the ranges tab here. We can also take a look at hands and we can say who has proportionally more of what hand class. OK, well, of course, we have more sets. That's because they don't have jacks or tens in range or over pairs because they three bet those pre. They have more top pair though. We can see that top pair accounts for 28% of their range and only 15% of our range. We can do the same thing with looking at second pair or third pair. So let's go back to the flop here. Here's an interesting method I'll show you guys. Here we bet 75 on the flop. We'll take a look at their strategy here. Strategy. And here I'm going to isolate their calls. So this is just their calling range. And we'll notice that this updates the hand classes. So against the range that calls are bet, we can see exactly how this range breaks down. They still have way more top pair. They still have way more second pair. And so what do you guys think will happen on a jack or a 10? Like here we have a two of clubs turn, but what happens if it turns a, a jack or a 10? Yes, that's right. We start donking, big blind starts leading, okay? That's a good prediction. Well, let's take a look at draws next. If we just select the flush draws, these are about equal, okay. Well, we'll ignore flush draws for a while. So let's take a look at this, the jack or the 10 after they call. Now, instead of selecting a specific turn card, I'm going to select turn reports. There we go. We can see on a jack or a 10, it starts leading. And we already know why it's leading. And that's because, of course, we've looked at the range distribution. We've looked at who has the advantage in what hand class. And from there, we can extract the strategy. Now, sometimes you'll see this without having first looked at the range and, and you'll see, well, that's weird. Why is it donking on a jack? Isn't a jack better for the aggressor's range? Well, not in this exact formation, because Button's 75% pot size bet has fewer top pair than Big Blind defends with. That's because Big Blind's defending range is more condensed towards these strong mate hands, whereas Button's larger bet size is going to contain more over pairs and such, and fewer of these top pair hands. So that will give the trips advantage to the defender on a jack or a 10. Admin says, however, check could still be better if villain bets too often on these runouts. Yeah, so this is going into exploitative land. So for example, if you think that villain is going to donk huge on any 10 or jack, well, Perhaps in that case, you want to start checking back more tenor jack as an exploit to capitalize on their ambition. That's a very specific read, but it is exploitatively sound. What is the in position response after we check on a jack return? Good question. So let's take a look. We check. And I'm just going to group this by cards. And we can see that the jack or the 10 is still bet the least often. And typically when we do bet, it's going to be a large bet. 
fact, I'll just ungroup those and I'm going to change it to percentage pot. So roughly a pot sized bet is the preferred sizing, but still checking back the vast majority of the time. Something else you can do here is, for example, we can change this to default and change this to the button expected value. And we can see that the Jack or the 10 are among the worst boards or the worst runouts for our range, even after they've checked to us, even after they've weakened their range. And so if we start ripping in a bunch of money on these boards, exploitatively, big blind should never donk. They should range check, wait for us to over aggress on the Jack or 10 turn, and then hit us with a lot of aggressive check raises. So. Again, why did I go into the turn reports rather than just clicking Jack or 10 here, guys? I realize not everyone has a premium subscription. Some people have starter, in which case you have to do that. Actually, I think in this formation button versus big blind, you have turn reports even in starter. But anyway, the reason I went into reports rather than a specific flop or sorry, a specific turn card, is because I want to find those broader heuristics, right? I want to find the overarching strategy. So let me change this back to chart mode. Here, after we've bet 75% on the flop, we can find the general uh, turn strategy. Now we can see we're very rarely going to go to X pots, and we're very rarely going to go with a small size. The vast majority of the time, we're going to be using something in this range of 75 to 175, a larger bet size. I would say probably simplify this to something near a pot sized bet as your continuation bet on the turn. So any questions about this so far, guys? Looks good. So I see a lot of people that have asked questions in the Discord, but they're not looking at their opponent's response. I think analyzing how your opponent responds to different strategies in the GTO solution is fundamental to any kind of analysis. Ask yourself if their response is human. Is it realistic? What kind of bluff catches do they need to find? How would you exploit mistakes in a deviation of their strategy? And as I said, analyzing your opponent's response is also just absolutely required to understand blockers. You, you cannot understand blockers without looking at their response. We do have the blocker tool, the blocker score, of course, for premium members, but even then you still need to look at their response to understand what's going on. So let's say we bet 175 here. Now, again, we want to start looking for thresholds in big lines range. Most people's eyes are drawn towards uh, this and they just see a mess. I'm looking straight here. This is the first thing I see is this little indifference threshold here at the top pair and this one here as the value raise. I'm, my eyes go straight here to see where these thresholds are. And then I start analyzing. Okay, top pair. Okay, King Jack plus always continuing. We start mixing with a lot of other hands. Queen Jack is very close to folding versus this overbet. Okay, second pair. Again, completely indifferent, regardless of suit, with an overcard to the Jack and pure folding otherwise. Okay, what about third pair? Well, third pair can also be a flush draw. And so we see these diamond combos. You see, this is why I like this view here this horizontal view because I can just see the diamond combination right in here without having to hover over it. We can see these diamond combos always continuing and the rest of the third pair always folding. What about the draws? Well, okay, there's still quite a few draws here. Draws account for, oh, a huge part of your range, about a third of your range overall. So you can't continue with every draw, especially against such a large size. But for flush draws anyway, we can see that a combo draw, something that contains a six and a diamond always continues. So again, I'm looking at hand classes. I'm looking at thresholds. Uh, I'm noticing that, for example, the nut flush draw without any other type of combo draw is just going to be indifferent. Flush draws without some sort of other equity are pure folds, for example, king five, king four, king three. Flush draws that are in combination with other types of draws, for example, queen eight here is a gut shot and a diamond draw. Same with king nine. These hands can start raising, right? These are our combo draws. Um, so these, again, four two here, 
you know, you've got the pair of twos, you've also got the four, these combo draws are continuing more. And so I'm looking for where the thresholds are, and I'm analyzing villain's response to see if this is realistic. Now, what do you guys think? Do you think that villain is ever folding queen jack? Do you think they're finding calls with queen 10? No to both. Well, that's difficult. This one is perhaps not a great example because uh, responses to overbets are somewhat straightforward because you're narrowing the ranges so quickly. So perhaps we say that big blind calls and we put an ace on the river. Here we'll put in a shove. Again, what's the shoving range? Well, it's about two pair plus. Okay, so let's say they put in the shove here. Now, who here thinks they find calls with ace seven, ace eight, ace nine, six four, six five, queen jack? Zola says people are going to snap fold these hands. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Six four, easy call. <laughs> yeah. And again, this is going to depend how you view your opponent. Of course, any one of these hands, 6-4 has the same amount of equity as a7. We can view this in the summary tab. Facing just over a pot-sized bet, you need just over 33% equity to call. So 6-4 and a7 have about the same equity here. These are both indifferent bluff catchers. Taking a look at the thresholds here, we can see that I'll show you a little trick here. Instead of selecting everything separately, you just hit this up arrow, and then we hit this down arrow, and here I've selected all these indifferent hands. These hands that are kind of right on the line, low pair to top pair kind of hands. And here we can see where the thresholds are. So again, you need to be looking at the response, and you need to judge for yourself if the opponents in the games you're playing will find these bluff catchers if their response is realistic, if they'll find the correct value raises, if they'll find the appropriate amount of bluffs. Now, just to go back into theory land here, we've noticed that a lot of these indifferent bluff catchers are mixing. So, you know, it's not going according to hand strength, rather it's going according to blockers in this polarized line. And realistically, what actually matters is that you're calling often enough overall in order to not be exploited too hard by bluffs. Obviously, if they're not bluffing, you should overfold. And if they're over bluffing, then probably most of these become pure call. And so the reason it mixes is to try and make their bluffs indifferent. I'm sure most of you guys understand that. Now, admin says not at the correct frequencies, though. Yeah, now, even if they're not finding, for example, a call with 6-5, 18.8% of the time, no one is getting that spot on or even close. That doesn't matter specifically. Looking at the individual hands here is not what matters. What matters is their overall calling frequency relative to our value or bluffs. The reason that the silver is going to mix with various hands is to avoid creating exploitable blocker weaknesses. Because keep in mind, button knows exactly which hands big blind will defend with. And if big blind, for example, just calls the ace x and folds the six x, all of a sudden that creates an exploitable block weakness in big blind strategy that can be exploited. A human probably isn't going to find that, right? And so realistically, what matters is finding the overall calling frequency, right? Now you can try and approximate this with MDF. That's a little messy. It's a little cleaner here on the river, but you need to understand that finding this exact frequency is not important. Finding an overall calling strategy that isn't going to be exploited by over bluffs or you know, value owning you, that's more important. It's about the overarching defense rather than finding a 12% call with Jack seven, right? In fact, a human could redesign this strategy such that we fold this hand in this hand and call that hand in that hand. And that's probably going to be just fine. Maybe pure fold queen jack, pure call this hand. Um, you are creating some exploitable blocker weaknesses, but 
it's going to be very hard for your opponent to exploit that. So don't worry so much about the inconsequential mixing hands, mixed frequencies with one hand, rather focus on the overall strategy. Okay, let me go to some questions here. DRZ asks, obviously we deviate versus different villains. If nitty overfolding a lot versus more laggy, calling wider, right? Yes, of course. You obviously want to deviate. If you think that villain does not have the appropriate amount of bluffs in this bet, 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 triple barrel stack offline, if you think they're too value heavy, then all of a sudden, you see this long flat line here? All of these hands, which are right on the line, become pure faults. They'll shift down slightly and they'll become pure faults. And you'll only start calling with all the hands that are actually decent value, right? Matthias asks, why does Jack 10 sometimes check back? If we on the river, shouldn't we always bet the good hands? Okay, that's an interesting question. Let's take a look. Jack 10 here. So we can see that Jack 10 is perfectly indifferent between a bet and a check. And I suspect this hand is very close to the line. If I select all here, we can see that these hands have 80% equity against villain's range. If we go all in, we can see that we're going to hard block villain's calling range. So we block all of these hands, we block these hands and these hands, we block these hands and these hands. And so realistically, um, you're getting called by a6, ace2, uh, sixes, tens, you know, maybe some 10-6. Um, if you block too much of their calling range, all of a sudden you just start folding out worse and getting called by better, and even very strong hands uh, lose incentive to bets, even though they're way ahead, because you simply won't get paid off by worse hands. Nobody is clairvoyant. Right, so we cannot be called by worse enough. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So let me go over to the conclusion here. Uh, oh, you know what? We should cover this real quick. Building wider heuristics with reports. This is important. So let me pull up this one here. Now, something else that people underutilize are reports. Now, I've just selected like a random spin and go button versus big blind spot. I don't even really play sit and goes myself, but I know how to analyze reports to find data. I suspect most of you guys are cash game players. Um, regardless, reports can be used as a method for basically finding overarching trends. And I think a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll scroll through and they'll sort by big bet and small bet and which boards are checked most and checked least, which boards are bet big and bet small. And that's one way to go about it for sure. But I think a lot of people underutilize this grouping function. So you can group by, for example, high card. Here we can see these are all the ace high flops, king high flops, queen high flops, and so on. You can also filter. For example, we can apply just flush draw or just paired and see how that changes. And here we can see how it changes the overall betting frequency. So a flush draw paired board in this spin and go setup typically prefers a smaller bet. Someone asks, how can we make the colors different so that the reports are easier to visualize? Okay, that's an easy enough question. You can change that here in settings. And here you can change the exact colors or you can go to themes and select from some pre-made themes that will have different colors. So again, when you're looking at reports, utilize this grouping function and these filters and compare how the strategy changes as you apply filters. So here we can see the default strategy. And of course we can apply filters. So connected monotone, for example, we can see that the strategy starts using betting quite often and checking more on these lower cards and never using the big bets. You can also use this table mode. 
here we can see that 21% of all flops are ace high. And now, for example, if we just apply paired, we can see that 16.9% of flops are paired, and we can see how different hands play out. So ace high boards through nine high boards end up betting much more often. As you scroll through the game tree, this will also update. So here we've said button bets 33%, actions on us. And we can see in the big blind that we're basically just going to continue more often when the uh, high card is lower. And of course that makes sense because the big blind should have more an advantage on lower cards and less of an advantage on ace high. And that's because in spin and goes, you raise most of your, or a lot of your ace high pre-flop, so you're going to have less of an advantage on ace high boards. So try and use these reports to build broader heuristics. Something else you can do, for example, is, let me just pull up a random one here. Let's pull up this one here, king, queen, two. Instead of studying the exact strategy on King Queen 2, this is back to a cash game, by the way, you can use reports and we can say apply filters. So we have King Queen 2, but perhaps we want to spread that out a bit. Maybe it's something like this flush draw, not paired. So, how does the strategy look like when the highest card is ace through queen, second card is king through jack, low card is six through two? flush draw. And here we can see that it's almost always going to be utilizing an overbet as the most prevalent sizing and checking back a decent portion of the range. And so instead of studying just one board, you can apply filters such that the filters represent a variety of boards that look close to what you were, uh, that are somewhat similar to the flop you were already studying. So I had some other examples to go through, but I think we've covered this in a fair amount of detail already. Today's lecture was mostly about just showing you guys different methodologies and tools you can use to better find the overall strategy. Studying poker requires a combination of memory and intuition. There are far too many spots to memorize, so you do need to learn broader heuristics. Now, tools we can use to do this are studying thresholds, comparing hand classes on different boards, utilizing filters to separate value from bluffs, comparing ranges, looking at villain's response, using those reports to really try and find broader trends, creating a hypothesis and then trying to break that hypothesis. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed my lecture. I hope you found it useful. I'll take any questions you guys might have now. Dan says, I learn best from the big picture. Should I start using complex solutions now? I'm a bit new side to the solvers and use in general. Would it be better to wait until I'm more advanced to switch? Well, Dan, that is uh, something of a subjective question. I, most people hate the complex reports because they're so complicated. Personally, I kind of like them because I really like finding those interesting counterintuitive lines. The complex reports are really great when it comes to finding bet sizing trends in aggregate reports, finding new strategies. They're not so good for pure implementation because of course they take a lot of mixing. And so I think the complex reports are best for looking at broader trends, whereas the simpler solutions are better for studying specific strategies. So if you're leaning more towards the intuition side, if you're trying to get some broader heuristics, complex reports are reasonable. If you're looking more at the just a simple implementable strategy, or you just want less data to deal with, you can use the simpler general solutions. Both have their purposes. A lot of my hands are out of line, so I have to look at complex. Fair enough, sir, fair enough. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming to my lecture. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to send me a message in the Discord, either privately or publicly in the weekly coaching section. Camilo asks, if threshold calling range from the flop depends mostly on bet sizes, as we know, is it okay to use an MDF approach to approximate our calling range, considering we have to overfold flop for a bit? Yeah, um, absolutely. I've, I've done some other lectures on how MDF correlates to the actual GTO strategy. Uh, it's not a direct correlation. The more value checkbacks they have, the less MDF seems to apply, but typically out of position will overfold a bit. 
On later streets, MDF seems to be a much closer approximation to the actual GTO strategy. And overall, just continuing wide enough versus certain sizes uh, is a good way to create a balanced strategy that's not going to be too exploitable to bluffs or value bets. Well, I'm going to end it here, guys. Thank you all for coming and have yourselves a great day. Happy grinding. Mm -hmm.